Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started today. My name is Julie Mulvihill, and I'm the Executive Director for Humanities Kansas. And happy National Arts and Humanities Month. We're so glad to have you here with us today at noon for this really exciting and exceptional presentation and interview that you're about ready to hear. Now, this is part of our Big Idea programming, and the Big Idea is an online program to highlight and inspire fresh thinking in humanities and humanities scholarship. We are going to have a really great conversation between um, Valerie and Mariama. We'll do introductions in just a, a few seconds. We do welcome your participation. We have the chat box open if you want to talk to one another. We also have the Q&A. So if you want to send a question directly to our guests, you can do that as well. Now, each big idea begins with a short essay or an overview um, by our featured speaker or about our featured speaker about the topic. And the idea being is that this gives you a little bit of um, opportunity to learn a little bit more before you engage with this conversation. And we'll post that information in the chat box. So if you haven't had a chance to read that, you can. And really what we hope is that you'll take the conversation that you hear today over the noon hour and take it with you to the next time you get together with your friends and your family and share this information and do what, what we like to call spark a conversation, conversation with your friends and your families about ideas that matter. And so to begin, I'd like to introduce our moderator and host for today, Dr. Valerie Mendoza. She's going to introduce and interview our special guest. Dr. Mendoza is a Topeka native and received her PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley. She works in the public humanities where her research really focuses in on the history of the Latinx community, both in Kansas and in the broader Midwest. Uh, she has served as a consultant to the Historical Society, the Kansas Creative Arts Industries Commission, the National Folklife Network, and of course, we are so happy that she's been involved with Humanities Kansas for a number of years in a number of different capacities. So welcome, Valerie. I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Julie. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and thank you, Mary Emma Graham, for being here as well. It is my pleasure to introduce her. Mary Emma Graham is a native of, of Augusta, Georgia, is University Distinguished Professor of English at the University of Kansas, and founding director of the History of Black Writing, which she established at the University of Mississippi in 1983. The History of Black Black writing has led national and international initiatives to promote research, teaching, and public engagement with Black literary studies, with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Ford, and Mellon Foundations. Progress Professor Graham is the author of 12 books that have helped to redefine the field, especially the Cambridge Companion to Af the African American Novel, and with Jerry W. Ward, the Cambridge History of African American Literature. On the occasion of the History of Black Writing's 40th anniversary and Graham's retirement from teaching to full-time writing, an intergenerational panel of distinguished scholars gathered at the Modern Language Association's January 2023 conference to celebrate accomplishments, ongoing significance, and new ventures in archiving, programming, and literary research and its expanding community of digital scholars and practitioners. We are very lucky that Mary Emma lives in Lawrence and she is working on two new books. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here and, and jump in with, uh, with questions. So for those of us who don't know very much, tell us a little bit about Margaret Walker and her life. Uh, thank you, Valerie, for, for having me. And hello, everyone. Uh, my favorite topic, of course, is to talk about Margaret Walker. Um, there's a saying that uh, Nikki Giovanni gave me that she was the most famous person nobody knows. So a lot of people know about her. Too many people, in my view, don't know about her. Uh, and so I guess the first thing that people who do know uh, knew her as a literary figure, a uh, very important figure in the 20th century. Um, 
she was a poet and a novelist and the poetry, there are five volumes most people only recognize for my people because it is it carries the title poem that was so famous and that was read everywhere. Uh, I most recently learned that it was not, it was read at the um, fest, first Festac conference in Nigeria. Uh, and so the poem just made its way around the literally around the world, but five volumes of poetry, the novel Jubilee, which came two decades before we embraced this idea of a neo-slave narrative that people like Toni Morrison made famous. But Walker had written a novel, a family narrative, which he adapted to fiction uh, in that tradition, again, 20 years earlier. So that part of her life um, as a literary figure took her through pretty much the 20th century, at least the first half of it. Um, when she settled into a career as an academic, she sort of started what I consider this other career, which is even lesser known, and the one that I was able to plug into in, a, in an interesting way, because at that point, Walker was bringing people together in all kinds of conferences and events uh, in Mississippi, which was extremely unusual beginning in the 60s. Now we know what the 60s were like. We know what Mississippi was like. And yet the sort of bold approach she had to gatherings and public engagement, terms that are common to us today, but were not even in use. They had not become common parlance at that time. Walker initiated all of that. And so many of us were beneficiaries of what she did and what she was associated with and her, her fearlessness in doing it at a time that was certainly uh, scary for so many people. Uh, we know we are doing these things today, but we don't associate them with her. So I like to say that she was largely responsible for democratizing the humanities that we now embrace. That is the way in which we operate as humanists, the way in which we plan and think about larger communities. This is the stuff she was doing. And I attribute it to her because I'm sure people were doing it in various sectors, but Walker made a point of making, of, of reaching out across all kinds of lines and borders. And she did it from a place that most people were afraid to even go to. Um, again, in the 60s and 70s. And so um, when you know her as the writer, the poet, the literary figure, you know her as this uh, sort of public educator, I use that term perhaps, and humanist who was redefining the way we think about what operates outside of the classroom, what comes to people in ways that uh, we are not separated, but we are united in our understanding and our learning and in and in the goal, higher goal of education. That's when we think about Walker's, I think, significance, at least that's the way I came to understand her um, in writing this, this book. And I guess the other thing is all the unpublished stuff that we don't know. It's again, what we don't know versus what we know. Walker was, I would say, a foremost public intellectual. Now, if you went to one of her speeches, you would hear all that she had to comment on. I mean, I, every time I look at MSNBC or any of the newscasts, I think about how Walker would get up in front of any public and make those kinds of comments. Yeah. It didn't matter whether it was a church or whether it was a school or a high school. And she started doing it in the forties. She was making those kinds of public statements, assessing what was happening in the country very, very early. But the people who heard that represented a relatively small sector of the country. One, because of segregation, because in higher education, needless to say, uh, her career was spent as HBCU. So she went to every institution, many, many, to every state literally in the US, but the people who listened intently and heard her, I think represented a particular core of the American public. Uh, mm -hmm. And so without sort of a larger platform, we, many of us know her, but far too many of us don't. But those are the ways that I think, that's, those are the things that she's known for, or I like to think will be better known for in the by and by. 
Yeah, such a fascinating person. You've given me so much to ask you about. Let me start with that, you know, first half of her career that um, that you mentioned. Um, I'm really interested in the Chicago Black Renaissance. So when did this take place? Who was involved? You know, um, tell me a little bit about that. So Walker was part, was conventional. That is her life cycle, her life uh, framing is what happened to, to virtually many, many people who left the South, born and raised in the South, go North for higher education. I mean, uh, undergrad and, and early school is done, of course, in, in the segregated South. So goes North, Northwestern University uh, to Iowa grad school, twice, two times at Iowa. So she goes South, she goes North to get the education. Um, <laughs> And of course, she's in Chicago. And most people know about New York and what we call the Harlem Renaissance. Well, there was a Chicago Renaissance and Walker was a central figure in that Renaissance. The one name that most people know is Richard Wright. She was not only a central figure, she was a key person in that Southside Writers Group where Wright was uh, a convener in the 1930s. So if the 20s were big in New York, the 30s were very, very big in Chicago. And Walker was absolutely a central figure in that. And so what might have been different between the Harlem period or the writers of the Harlem Renaissance and the writers and, the, and those people and intellectuals who were in Chicago is that it was much more interdisciplinary. So you had newspaper people um, uh, like Frank Marshall Davis, a Kansan, uh, work's been done on him by Edgar Tidwell. Uh, so Frank Marshall Davis would come to those meetings. He was a journalist at the time. You had, of course, poets like Margaret Walker, and she first read uh, For My People. Uh, she first read it to the group and got feedback on it. Um, Richard Wright, of course, the big B figure, big, big figure. Um, uh, the, the the people who started museums, uh, the, 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 the Gustavo Museum, those individuals were there. So you had people who were doing various different kinds of things and not just writing literature, but certainly the biggest figure at that time was uh, Richard Wright. And so what happens when a person like that is known as part of something, you lose everybody else. You'll get right, you'll get his reputation, but you don't get other people. But you had other poets like Arnabon Thompson, you had sociologists, uh, St. Clair Drake. You had people coming to the workshop who were from all sectors because they were at the University of Chicago, they were at Northwestern and they had all migrated to Chicago. So it makes sense for us to understand that rich um, evolution of art and culture, education and knowledge um, it, as happening in Chicago in dis, in di, separate and distinct from New York, but parallel in many ways. Now, am I right in uh, remembering that she met Langston Hughes when she was very young and he was and one of the people who exactly. urged her to get out of the South? Absolutely. In fact, those were the words he said to her parents, get her out of the South. And I think people take that for a disparaging statement. That is, you know, the South is all that many people think it is and you should not benefit from experience. I think she, he was trying to say she needs more exposure she has gotten the best education, and I think she believes she did in the South. She went to a traditional Negro school uh, through her first two years of college. Uh, these were private um, institutions operated by various denominations of the Black church, um, both Catholic and um, Christian. Um, and so, or interdenominational, I should say. So she had that full education, but she did go north. And it was at the suggestion of Langston Hughes because he was on the road. He was speaking to the colleges. This was one of those unusual moments in Black culture, which gets looked over. Um, Mary McLeod Bethune would tap writers, and in the case of Langston Hughes, sponsor their trips. I want you to go around and talk to the colleges. She provided a car and a driver. And so Hughes went to the school where she attended and where her parents worked. And her mother, a stage mom of the best type, presented some of her daughter's poetry to Hughes. And Hughes said, 
this girl is good, but get her out of the South. And Walker, of course, you know, was fin nearing the end of her first two years of college. And by the way, she went to college at 15. So you've got somebody who's still very young and wanted to go away to college. Her parents thought she was too young. So they waited until the sister graduated. Her sister, her second, the, the, the second youngest. And the both of them went off to Northwestern. The parents drove them to Chicago where they enrolled in Northwestern. Uh, so she did get out of the South. And of course, Chicago was a very important influence on her life. She graduated and of course stayed there. And that's where you connect to the Harlem Renaissance. But Hughes remained a close friend for the rest of their of his life. Um, and there's correspondence between the two of them. There's um, uh, all kinds of uh, experiences that Walker uh, encountered with Hughes. Uh, he was a good friend when she spent time in New York uh, on uh, when the book was published. And th therefore it was the way Walker, I think entered, I'd say the literati. I mean, Hughes was, her uh, her champion. He saw her work. Um, she knew that the poetry she was writing it might have been very undeveloped at the time. It was imit you know Im imitative, of course, but she had formal training. And for those of you know you who know this period, the 1920s and 30s, and the burst of modernism, she was taught by modernists at Northwestern. But she adapted the techniques to a particular style of writing that became her own. And that's where a poem like For My People comes from, um, where it's not a poem that is inaccessible. It's a very accessible poem. And it is grounded in historical, as a historical narrative. It's got the rhythm and the sounds of that history. And it is, it is a very uh, performative piece. And of course, today we think about performative poetry as a different type of poetry, but Walker, was talking and thinking about the readers, the listeners. And so not surprisingly, she read that poem everywhere. It was always the last thing in a speech she gave and everybody would rise from the audience and they give her a standing ovation because she was, she performed the poetry. She knew it was her favorite poem. It was her favorite poem. It was a poem people were waiting to hear. So she had that cachet with audiences. She was like a modern rock star in a lot of ways in her era and in the community that she was part of. So that's the knowing and the not knowing part of her life. But Hughes was central to all of that, as I said. And I think your title for this sort of segment of the big idea that Hughes might have been, uh, comes from that Hughes might have been the people's poet, but Walker was really the voice of her people. She really spoke on behalf of her people. If she had any kind of platform, she used it to speak for her people. And that's why that poem is such a powerful, you know, statement in that regard. Yeah. What an extraordinary life too. Cause as you were talking, I was thinking about, wow, meeting like someone who's so young and then being in college at that, at that time, you yeah. know, as a woman and as a black woman, very, very rare. Um, can you talk a little bit more about her more well-known pieces? And I want to, you talked about this a little bit, but I also want to hear more about Jubilees and specifically. So yeah, uh, I guess I'd have to say, just as it took me 20 years to finish this book, it took her 30 years to write Jubilee. Um, and it was a family story. It was her great grandmother's story that was told to her by her grandmother. And so in a sense, it is a family narrative. And of course, we didn't have the language that we have today. We didn't have the word neo-slave narrative. We didn't have any of that. So she called it a folk novel. She was telling a story of her family, fictionalized, but the characters come right out of that family history. So Viri was Elvira, who was her great-grandmother, but it was her grandmother's who, grandmother who was actually telling her the story. So she goes back a generation and, and and she was raised by a grandmother because her parents worked, you know, typical working parents who've got the mother-in-law living in home, helping to raise the kids. And so she had access to a tradition before her time. So Jubilee is written in sort of three periods. It's slavery, the Civil War, and then Reconstruction. And so we have the characters go through those three eras. And so you get all of that history 
of America in the novel, but it really is a woman's story. And that too was highly unusual. Some of us will remember that Zora Neale Hurston gave us a woman's story in the 1930s and that didn't get over very well. That book was silenced, criticized and didn't re get recovered until the 70s. But Walker was writing a woman's story, uh, main character, protagonist, and it was the challenges that she was facing in these three periods. She is uh, a household, you know, she's enslaved in a household, so she's a, a slave. She stays during the Civil War. And then she departs after that and builds community, becomes an entrepreneur. So we've got an interesting, and of course, there are lots of conflicts. But it is a typical, as I said, story about early Black life in both the slave South and the newly freed Black community emerging after slavery and after Reconstruction and all the conflicts therein. Uh, but it was 66, very early, the only thing like it for many years because the next book we get, our number of writers began to write what becomes called the slave narrative, neo-slave narrative. But Walker, in a sense, is a precursor. I'm not going to say she invented the form. I'm going to say she's a precursor to the form because she did give the name of the folk novel as her choice of a genre. But it is a powerful book. It's been translated seven to eight languages, maybe even more, never been out of print. And again, it has made its way around the world. So both her poetry and the novel had a very, have had a very long track record. Uh, it is commonly taught in the classroom, but it's a big book. And so reading it is one of those, you know, time consuming processes. And so people might read excerpts from it. Uh, I happen to be one of the people that got a chance to read the whole novel before I finished college. That was pretty rare. Uh, but it is a, on the reading list, remains on the reading list for that, for that period of American uh, history and culture. So, and it was an award-winning novel and just as her poetry was also award-winning volume. I love that uh, moniker, folk novel. You know, it's yeah. almost as yeah. if she was also, you know, I mean, she did use oral tradition to- um, Absolutely. Write. Yeah. yeah. I'm, gl I'm glad you mentioned that because what each chapter starts with is a line from a Negro spiritual or a folk saying. So each chapter brings into the story more knowledge of that folk history. And so it's, it's, it's both stylized in a way that you get not just a story, but you do get the cultural dynamic of folk life. It's music, it's history, the spirituals, the secular music, jazz, et cetera. So the titles are woven right through all of that. So it was, it was a pretty, pretty, pretty um, interesting style, stylization uh, for the period. Again, you're talking very early, the 60s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to come out during that, that time period, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What about some of her lesser known works? I'm sorry, what, what did you... What about some of her lesser known works? Oh, the, the lesser known works and the unpublished works. So, yeah. so For My People is the best known, of course, volume of poetry, but she had four others. The final collected volume, um, This Is My Century, is I think um, a really important volume because in it you see the, the poets, the poetry that emerges over a 40 year period because it comes out in the early 90s and she died in 98. And so as most poets do, they do their collected poems at some point in their career. So she she did smaller volumes dedicated to a particular period or idea in between For My People, but they were many years apart. For My People is 42. The next things don't come out until the 70s. And then she has a volume in the 90s. So by this time, her career is in, you know, is waning, but this is my century kind of brings people back to, to who she was and what she stood for. Uh, so I, I like to link for my people together with this is my century because it has new poems. It's not just collected poems. There are new poems there. 
but they show the evolution of someone's life through war, through troubled experiences, through rejection. Uh, but then because of her faith and humanity, her sense of the human condition, Walker always rises above all of that. So it's a particular kind of poetry, um, but it still has that rhythm of For My People. You still see the, 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 the style that she had made famous, uh, but, but those are lesser known works of poetry. She had several unfinished novels that never appeared. Um, when we came, she and I met, um, and I think the sole purpose of our relationship was to get as much of her work out as possible in the years she had left. So I was gifted that opportunity, and I do see it as a gift because I was learning about a writer's life, never thinking I would be writing a book or a biography. But I was also living, I had been born and raised in the South. I'm from Augusta, Georgia, as you said, but I had not experienced a writer who lived in the South and could talk about what that meant. I mean, I'm from Augusta, Georgia, the home of Frank Yerby, a writer for many years people thought was white, uh, but he passed, as we say. So I knew I knew writers existed. I know Southern writers, where the writers came from. But Walker gave me that in that inside story of the choices of living in the South and remaining. You go away to school, she came back. Most people go away to school, they don't come back to mm -hmm. the South. That's not true today, but in her time, it was. So we came together to really publish what she thought needed to be out there and they were the essays. So I had this wonderful opportunity to read all the unpublished work. And I just gave people a sliver of what was out there in two collections. Um, the, she, had, she had published one of, one of her essays because people wanted to know how Jubilee came to be. So she published an essay called How I Wrote Jubilee. And so I made that the title of one collection of essays. And it was more literary comments on literature, on Southern literature. Um, but then the other one was what I call her sort of political piece. And it was called On Be Being Female, Black and Free. And that was a title essay as well. That probably is the best known essay by her today. Because this is a woman who was not a feminist, she criticized the feminists severely. She sort of fell in between that period where thinking feminism was anti-male, misunderstanding its political implications. She couldn't really go with that flow. She was, of course, very pro-woman. She gave as much attention to women writers, new, upcoming, and those who had passed on as any one person I know. But she did talk about those three ideas. What does it mean to be black, female, and free? And her idea of freedom was not so much a liberated black woman, but what she called an emancipated black woman. Mm -hmm. There's a term that she kind of explains, which I find fascinating, but it is an essay that most people recognize and it gets included in a lot of anthologies. But those were the two volumes I helped her and I simply read everything and say, I think these, these come together well. Do you agree? She agreed. And so we got those two volumes of essays out before she died. Well, one before she died, the other came just as she passed. So okay. I feel it's important, glad about that. You have to tell us all how you two met because you just kind of glossed over it like, oh, you know, it's an everyday thing that I meet this famous writer and help her publish all her and um, published essays. <laughs> so. But it was the beginning of my career. And I think nobody could have a better beginning of their career than to work under a seasoned academic, a seasoned intellectual, and yet feel like you're making a contribution because you don't have many years left. Um, and, and I'm about where she was. I'm now about where she was then. And this idea of really working closely with somebody, um, and Walker was a collaborator, 
and I understood that I began to see the value of collaboration and it's been, a, you know, a, a hallmark of my life in terms of collaborating with people. Um, it, it gave me access in a certain way that I would otherwise not have had. So I'm, you know, working with Margaret Walker and I'm writing people and saying, you know, she spoke at so-and-so, do you have a, did you publish this essay? No, but she did speak, we have a recording. And that's another part of the experience that I learned and she taught me much is that she recorded everything. If she didn't write it in the journal, she literally recorded it with the first iteration of technology that we have. Umatics, anybody in the audience know that word? Before VHS, she was recording every event she had, and she had a lot of them. So I watched her operate across spheres, various publics, but also mindful of recording of everything she did. So it really did make it easy for me to complete the work that she needed me to do. I knew where she had it. She kept that itinerary, so I knew where she was. And again, if you're a journal journaler, you will write everything down. So she had all her itinerized names, phone numbers. We were still, you know, not thinking of mobile phones at the time. So I could track things down and do the work that she couldn't do. Um, but it was in a sense, I mean, I benefited from it. I've edited those two collections. So it wasn't that it took me away from my everyday work. It ha It enhanced what I was doing, but it also gave me uh, a, a heightened sense of responsibility and what kinds of things can work in different contexts. So public intellectual kind of work, sort of academic scholarly kind of work, those different areas I kind of got introduced to very early. And I what thought that was a valuable. Yeah, what an amazing way to start your career. I okay. want to turn to something you started out our discussion with, um, I guess, going to the that second half of her life um, when she taught at Jackson State University um, in Mississippi and founded the Institute for the Study of History, Life, and Culture of Black People. Arguably, she was at the forefront of the Black Studies community, you know. Can you, you talk a little bit about that? So if you think about the Black Studies movement, Walker absolutely is at the start of it. That is when it becomes, when it inherits that term, Black Studies. To be v brutally honest, Walker was placing her ideas <laughs> in what I mentioned earlier, this democratizing the humanities. She would write essays, for instance, on humanities with a black focus. Well, that's black studies. Um, and she would, you know, she'd map it out. She'd have an essay that explains what she means. What are the con what are the components of this humanities with a black focus? But this was the era of black studies. And so in the 60s, Walker from an, an, an historically black institution is giving us, and this is the first of its type, that is most black studies, and those of you who know this, the stages of black studies are important to mark. It became a white or PWI phenomenon. Even though they're HBCUs, most of those schools did not have black studies programs. The movement itself was within the PWI institution because black students and students of color generally were entering those institutions in large numbers and they didn't see anybody like them. And so they argued for a presence and a study of knowledge that was associated with them and their history. Well, Walker was, was situated in a black institution. Uh, Howard University at the same time was doing some of this kind of work, you know, uh, they would call what is a black university? That was the way they framed it. What is a real black, not a Negro, but a black university? Walker presented it from, you have to think about the culture and the history, which is the Institute was named before, of course, it became the Margaret Walker Center, which is what it's called today, named after her, renamed after her. She was framing that Institute in ways that we all now operate. 
They had programs for teachers. They had special events and activities. They had core classes that were changed. So she was doing black studies in a real sense, but she did it in a way that involved the people themselves. That is Walker brought, probably brought more people, politicians, international uh, leaders, artists, musicians, uh, um, to her events than anybody I know. I mean, if you look over the records and, she, and she's writing individual letters of invitation to have people come. Uh, and, and she herself had a sense of the interdisciplinarity of the arts and the humanities. So when Jubilee turned 10 years old, it became a folk opera. Oh, wow. <laughs> and they had a big near Hollywood opening, I would call it. I mean, she really brought all the actors in. Ossie Davis was there. They were good friends. Ruby D. She's knowing not just literary people. She's knowing artists. She's knowing entertainers. She's knowing musicians. But she that was performed in Jackson by the opera there. An, uh, an opera company had been founded in Jackson. And her Jubilee was one of its performances that season in 1976. That's but amazing. he had an opening that was bar none. I mean, it you you could just see and pictures from it. Literally, all the people who was anybody, governors, you name them, everybody was there. Nobody imagines this happening in in, in Mississippi in that time. You know, the right. most gated place in the South. But Walker was that convener. She was that glue. She was that voice of many people who said, "If we can do it anywhere, if we do it in Mississippi, we can do it anywhere." So she yeah. was given us a model. Um, so that part of her career sort of jump started on a sort of another phase of her writing. And so the artist, literary, you know, uh, poet figure also becomes the biographer, a biography of Richard Wright. But on her way to doing that, she, as a very bold and very, uh, a person who's who felt integrity is the one thing you cannot lose, the one thing you must defend. She was fearless when she discovered that Alex Haley, who published Roots in 1976, 10 years after her, had plagiarized from her work. And of course, we now know he plagiarized from her and a bunch of other people. So she sued him. It was a decision that she made boldly, was discouraged by many people because they knew what was going to happen. She's a black man, a, a, a black woman suing a black man who is yeah. now, has got the top film and book that's out. Yeah. Jubilee versus Roots. Roots is a major, tele, what we call a television film or film for TV. And this is the first of its type. Mm -hmm. It launched a career, a new career for television. But she did that. And of course, you I don't have to tell most people that story because it did bring, a, I would say, the downfall of that part of her career because she was doing the right thing. She was severely criticized and literally had no support. She lost in the courts. Now, we don't need to talk a lot about that. Why it wasn't that it wasn't true, but she lost in the courts. Mm -hmm. And so the public reputation that came after that really created a downfall in a significant way. Now, Walker was a woman of faith that she was not going to let her destroy her life. But in terms of reputation, it did have a tremendous impact. So there's sort of that beginning with second half and then the right biography comes after Roots and the reputation that she had earned spills over into the biography and people, the reception for that book is also negative. Mm, yeah. So that so those two things, when you put them together, uh, do create uh, 
a terrible environment and one that you cannot escape from easily because the public is now absorbing this reputation. The public is talking about it. So when I started writing the book and I'd mentioned, because I'm still, I'm interviews are, are very much a part of the book. That's the kind of the voice I wanted to include everybody who knew her. People would say, when I'd say, mention her name and they'd say, isn't that the woman who sued Alex Haley? <laughs> everybody identified her wow. not with the first part of her career mm -hmm. but with those actions in or wrote a negative biography of Richard Wright those were the two things she was most known for in the latter part of her career wow, wow. and That's so yeah it, it it was it was sad uh and there are people I did talk to don't reveal as much about that in the book because they were um, you know, private conversations who spoke to her during that period. And she was, of course, deeply hurt, deeply pained by that experience and by the lack of broad support by the people that she had supported so much of her life. Um, and so this is a Black woman who's, you know, a crisis moment for her that she endured. Um, but, and she did endure it. It's not that it took her down. She moved through it uh, as I said, because she was a woman of faith. And so you do not let that take you down. Other people may see you a certain way, but your inner self is still strong and, and survives and moves past it. Yeah. Well, as we wind down, is there anything else you wanted to tell us about your works, the Center for Black Writing? Anything that we can look forward to from you? Well, I, I guess I have to put a plug in for the uh, upcoming Philly Sweetly Festival because that was one of the things and the traditions, it now has become a tradition, that Walker uh, inaugurated in 1973. She celebrated 200 years of Black writing in America. And... Ten years later, of course, I founded the history of black writing. So I didn't think about the connection until I just this moment is that, and I was at that seventy three conference, and so Walker celebrated, and I think this was an important moment. It was before a lot of these these difficulties had emerged. She was celebrating black women writers. This was the beginning of that big, you know, uh, the, the black women's literary renaissance. Walker is at the center of that. The poets came to Mississippi. She was celebrating a poet and it was top news. New York Times, everybody, I mean, the way we do media today, she had access to all the forms of media at that time with this festival. Uh, and the poets who were growing in numbers came and to celebrate Phyllis Wheatley. So we're doing 50 years of Phyllis Wheatley at the Margaret Walker Center in Jackson, Mississippi, November 1st through 4th. So that festival will bring back the people who were there in 73 and bring in new generations of writers, poets, et cetera, who we have today. And I think that that's going to be, uh, uh, the link to that is being shared. So you will see uh, all the, the stars. It's, it's a star-studded occasion. Uh, it is comparable to what Walker would have done had she been alive because she would have had access to those people herself. But she brought everybody in in 1973 and the center is bringing a lot of people in uh, in November to celebrate that. So the History of Black Writing is in its 40th year and the new director, Aisha Hardison, I am really pleased uh, and grateful that she uh, she's sort of taken this monster over. Um, and we are we have an exhibit in Spencer Museum, uh, Black Writing, that is going to go through January. So everybody in the area, please go and check out the exhibit. It tells some of our history and what we are doing now. Uh, and um, I am, again, thinking as I'm speaking here that if Walker did that in 73, and I was just beginning sort of my journey in graduate school and trying to figure out, and then 10 years later, somehow I thought I could do this history of Black writing, I guess that boldness had to rub off on me. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And so, and, and, but all of the humanities work that I have been doing, I guess, again, you know, what do we say? Um, the apple doesn't fall from far from the tree. 
thank you so much. This was just a wonderful conversation. I learned so much. Really appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge about Margaret Walker. And I'll turn it back over to Julie. <laughs> wow. Wow, wow, wow. This was like listening to a legend talking to a legend, talking about a legend. And so thank you so much, Mary Emma. You know, I think that there's a lot of things that we can take away from today's presentation. But for me, I know for sure that thanks to Mary Emma's work, quote, the most famous person nobody knows, unquote, will now become better known. So we're so grateful for this book um, that you've written, Mary Emma, and for your willingness to go around and talk about it. It's just been terrific. So for those of you who are big idea enthusiasts, I want to put a plug in. We'll be back right here at noon on November 10th, and we will be hosting Sheena Hernandez. And Sheena is an English professor at Garden City Community College here in Kansas. And she's going to be discussing the need for cultural and racial representation in literature and why it is important for all of us to read authors with lived experiences. So I know you won't want to miss this. So thanks to much, so much to Valerie and Mariemma, and I hope everyone has just a terrific day. <laughs>